Thanks for having me, guys, and hello and welcome. As you mentioned, I'm Justin Jacobson, so we'll start by talking a little about me, giving you a little background on kind of you know who I am and kind of what I do, and then we'll kind of go into the lecture a little. So, as mentioned, I'm an esports and entertainment attorney, and for the last decade, I've worked with all different professional athletes and musicians and DJs and fashion designers and all kinds of creative people and handling all their legal and business matters. And about six years ago, I really expanded into the esports and gaming world, working with pro gamers and streamers and coaches and casters and teams and brands and all kinds of companies working in the space. And for the last year, I've been running Ford Models' new esports and gaming talent division, which for those who are not familiar, Ford Models is a high-end luxury talent agency. And in the last year, they've kind of shifted more towards a traditional influencer agency. And they brought me in to create this talent agency where I work with over 20 different gaming talents and handle you know the day-to-day -day business management of pro gamers and streamers and coaches and casters. I'm also teaching esports business at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, among some other universities, and I'm very involved in the academic world, helping develop different curriculums for esports law and esports business classes. And as Andrew mentioned, I've authored the first esports business law book, The Essential Guide to the Business and Law of Esports and Professional Video Gaming. So needless to say, I'm very involved in all different areas of the scene and you know a kind of just as a disclaimer nothing here is intended as legal advice as it's all for educational purposes only and today we're going to explore various professional careers in the esports and professional gaming world this is by no means exhaustive as this is just really meant to highlight some potential opportunities that exist and kind of just spotlight what's going on especially in the last few years since esports and the whole professional and competitive gaming world has really kind of exploded and become a lot more mainstream than it maybe was, you know, five, ten years ago or even longer. So where we kind of start is probably the people that are everyone's most familiar with. And, you know, I kind of refer to them as, you know, the key parties of this esports business ecosystem. So there's four main parties. There's the gaming talent. So that includes the pro gamers, the streamers, the content creators, any coaches or analysts, any on-air talent so any shoutcasters or event hosts or mcs really all the individuals that either compete professionally at on various titles on pc mobile or console in games such as league of legends dota 2 valorant csgo call of duty um arena valor and lots of other games and these are also the individuals who create original content and live stream content on platforms such as twitch youtube twitter and tiktok so this is obviously, you know, a very well-known professional area that's going on in esports and probably the one that people are most familiar with. Another area is the esports teams and organizations. So these are the companies and teams that actually field competitive teams that compete in different tournaments and leagues, as well as actually sign creators and streamers to stream and work on behalf of their team and their sponsors. So this, there's different opportunities to work with teams, whether you're actually part of the management team as an owner or some other kind of executive, as well as just other individuals that work for a team. So you're talking about talent management, so the individuals that are working directly with the talent that the team signs, handling the logistics of airlines and flights and rooms and whatever else the players need. You actually have you know social media matters, the individuals that manage all of the team's social media their Twitter, their YouTube, their Twitch, all their different platforms. And some of them have different languages. So you have the ability to kind of translate and work in different languages. If you know, I know some teams have Japanese Twitter that they engage. So that's a really unique thing. And then you have teams that are similar, the business development and sponsorship development and marketing teams. And because a lot of these esports organizations have some ownership groups that are traditional sports franchises, they've really started to model the way these teams work to how their traditional sports teams operate, where they have a lot of these different internal divisions the same way the team does. So there's a lot of opportunities to be a professional. You might not necessarily own a team or even be a player, but you can work for a team and different roles from HR to PR to marketing to event production because a lot of these teams are 
hosting their own events, throwing their own tournaments, even running their own academies and training programs and youth camps. So there's just a lot of unique professions as part of working for a team organization. Then one of the other major parties is, you know, the game publishers. So these are the individuals, you know, game publisher and developers I know everyone are very familiar with as they create and sell the game. So we have, you know, large ones like Activision Blizzard and Riot Games and Epic Games and Valve and Supercell and, you know, many more, both indie and major publishing houses. And there's opportunities to work as software developers there or coders and testers. And then you have the whole corporate side where you can work in public relations or marketing or promotions for the game. HR or business development, the legal department, finance, accounting, and really all these other corporate roles that these large companies have. So there's a lot of different ways. If you're not necessarily, you know, coder or involved in the animation or some of the back end stuff, to still be involved in a professional capacity. And then finally, the fourth um, part of this ecosystem is the event organizers. So these are the people that organize the companies that organize a different leagues and tournaments that are competed in. So this includes the collegiate level and professional level and high school and youth and recreational. And these are different companies that will actually host and market these events. So some large companies are ESL and DreamHack and PGL and there's some other smaller ones and they're ones that operate internationally and some that just operate in a specific game and some that operate in multiple games. So there's obviously opportunities to work on the production side. We're actually hosting, conceptualizing these events, as well as on the marketing promotion of these events, especially as you start growing and having bigger venues, the promotional aspect gets even more important. And then similar to the other areas, including the teams, there's actually sponsorship and brand partnership and business development people and these professionals are there to help grow the sponsorship opportunities, get streaming and broadcasting and television deals and media rights and press and really just kind of build the hype and exposure for the events. And that's how it all kind of becomes a very unique ecosystem. So these are kind of the biggest professions that are kind of going on in these four major areas which i think are what most people think about when you think about esports and gaming you have the players and the teams and the publishers and the event organizers and how they all interact with each other however in addition to all of these other areas and where kind of myself and many of my other colleagues fit in is kind of this whole other world of professionals that has kind of developed to support and work with these major areas so there's been a growth similar to many other entertainment, sports, and music, and other talent-driven worlds of professionals and companies that are servicing the professional gaming world. This is business and financial and legal and marketing and accounting and media professionals and consultants who are all having full-time roles the same way you would be in the music world or sports world or TV or movies and servicing the esports and professional gaming. So starting with, you know, something that's near and dear to me, there's been a, a large growth of esports attorneys and lawyers kind of focused on the space. There's always been video game attorneys and individuals who have kind of helped different publishers and just, you know, companies operating in the video game space. But as esports and the professional gaming side, especially from the talent side, has grown, there's been a whole slew of professionals, both existing attorneys who are already involved in ancillary spaces kind of going in as well as new attorneys kind of developing their book and working in the space as well as existing larger law firms that have been developing internal divisions to service their clients needs in this space so it's really unique to see the same way there's sports law music law or fashion law for there to be a whole new world of esports law and really at least esports law in general is really unique similar to these other areas where it's really a mix of different legal fields it's really a combination of intellectual property law focused on licensing and name and likeness rights and copyrights and trademarks and kind of how all this stuff interplays and then you have contract law because the basis of the agreements whether it's signing a player to a team or a streaming deal or a sponsorship deal or an appearance or any kind of rights transferring is contract law 
And then you have kind of business law and how that affects when you have LLCs and corporations and kind of how that all plays into the business that is esports. And then tax law and how that fi- factors in. Obviously, it's a very international world, so you have players going across the country and across the world to earn money and earn salaries and compete in tournaments. And a lot of countries have foreign income tax on income earned by non-citizens. So there's just a lot of potentially legal matters that need assistance with. You also have visas and immigration. Obviously, as I mentioned, it's a very international world. So navigating these complicated legal matters, especially in light of COVID and what's going on there, is a very unique aspect. And having this knowledge in the esports world is unique because as someone who's dealing with immigration on a pretty daily basis now, the government not really that familiar with esports and gaming and especially some of the newer leagues and tournaments and takes a lot of explaining and trying to have a lot of subject matter knowledge while also understanding the law to be able to craft something that's useful and that will go through an application that has value. So, again, there's been this whole specializing area of individuals that understand the ecosystem, understand the business, and are able to provide these legal services that maybe someone who doesn't deal with it on a day-to-day basis. It's not something they're familiar with. They don't know what the different rates are for different players, what these different metrics mean, what different teams are playing. So similar to, you know, in the music world or TVs or movies where you're going to, you know, attorney who has that kind of knowledge, it's starting to apply in this space as well. And then obviously because a lot of it has to do with digital communications and digital marketing and things on stream, you have the FTC considerations and the FCC considerations and DMCA and all of these licensing matters that need to properly be addressed or they could subject the talent or the business or the company to some potential legal matters. So as you see and as the numbers show, there's been a larger shift to that and the need for more attorneys that have a unique aspect and understanding of the scene and how it works has really kind of grown and that's why you see a nice trend of that kind of building off of that similar to other talent driven worlds sports music tv there's been a whole new profession of esports talent agents and management companies and talent agencies being created so this includes newly boutique formed ones by individuals who maybe were former players or former coaches or just somehow connected in the industry, as well as existing legacy talent agencies such as William Morris and CIA and IMG and UTA creating esports and gaming talent division where they're specifically working with some of the top talent. And it's really interesting because these agencies, especially the large ones, are used to working with top NFL players and NBA players and, you know, movie stars and screenwriters and directors and all of these AWS people that we see on, you know, TMZ and people. So to start seeing these businesses starting to incorporate that and creating whole divisions just really shows the viability of it and the growth that's happening. And being the other role that I mentioned in my role at Ford Esports and Gaming, this is really where I handle a lot of this similar stuff where... My day-to-day is very interesting where I'm helping manage these talent and helping them develop and feel different opportunities, whether it's finding sponsorship arrangements or appearances or press inquiries or any strategic partnerships that really help and grow and develop them. And I think that's a unique aspect that's only really been growing in a unique profession that's only really started to scratch the surface. Obviously, because it's such a new industry, there's a lot of learning on both sides whether it's the professionals themselves learning how to navigate the space as well as especially the talent learning how to work with professionals whether it's attorneys or managers or agents or any of the other professionals that we're gonna talk about throughout the rest of this lecture so there's a lot of give and take and a lot of learning that goes on which is exciting and that's what makes this profession and what's going on here so cutting edge and new where Literally, 10 years ago, this there wasn't esports lawyers. There wasn't some of the other professions that, you know, talent agents that are focused on esports. It just wasn't a thing. Now you can Google and you can find 10 of each of them pretty easily. 
Additionally, there's been a whole growth of different marketing and public relations and data analytic firms and professionals focusing, focusing just on the esports and gaming space. This includes digital marketing firms that are working specifically on esports and gaming, as well as some of the traditional ad agencies, the madmen that we think about on Madison Avenue, creating divisions solely focused for esports and gaming and these other less traditional areas so they can service these clients. So they can, some of the clients that they're working with, they can actively and authentically engage in this space by having professionals that understand the space, but also have the marketing background or the PR background or the other resources that one of these agencies might have. So it's really interesting to see how these new consulting and marketing companies are being formed. And these are essentially spearheading the marketing campaigns for different brands, whether they're working directly with talent to help them get opportunities or with brands to secure talent or teams to work with them, so or even operators of different events. So there's a lot of ways to be you know work with the esports and gaming space to work in this professional competitive scene while not necessarily being a gamer or not working for an event organizer or a publisher. As we're starting to go through, you're starting to see that these more traditional areas, the same way there's sports marketing agencies and PR agencies that are just for entertainment or music, they're starting to be these that are focusing just on the esports and gaming space. And these public relations firms are working on behalf of professional gamers or teams or event organizers or the leagues themselves to help interact with the esports media and press as well as traditional press outlets to secure the New York Times and Washington Post and some of these more traditional outlets that a PR agent might do in, you know, political world or the music or sports scene or even the tech world. So again, you're starting to see more of these professionals seeing the value and the need to have these professionals. You're starting to see organizations wanting to have formal PR people that are putting out their press releases. Not the way a lot of these team announcements are where it's like, they just put out a tweet, we just signed this guy, and that's the announcement of a sponsor. This is, And you're starting to see teams understanding the value in doing an official press release. Having a PR or marketing team or professionals behind what they're doing because it only amplifies what they're doing and as they're working with larger companies it just kind of helps professionalize all of it in addition because a lot of it is all data driven you have fantasy esports companies and esports betting which is you know obviously outside of this but you have also have data analytic companies that are essentially providing in-depth data on kind of the analytics of a social media campaign or of a specific person, as well as companies that are focused on giving different talent insight where they're actually acting as player scouting departments and helping different teams source talent by analyzing the data, looking at how well the players do and certain rank things. Because there are certain things that you can see from the way a player plays that there are certain ways you can fix them with coaching and different strategy and game planning. So they're able to identify these different techniques and these different deficiencies and what strengths are necessary to you know, compete at a high level all through analyzing data. And you have all of these new companies that are being created that, again, are not gamers, they're not teams, they're not what we think about as traditional and part of the esports world, but they're very viable, and I guarantee some of these scouting services are making a lot more than a lot of the other businesses in the scene. And this is also very valuable because a lot of sponsorship opportunities, whether it's with brands for different teams or a player or a streamer or even an event organizer, it was all based on this analytics. So looking at content viewership, the minutes watched, the concurrent viewers, kind of the click-through rate, what the conversion rate of all this is, what these KPI are. And this is all understood and gathered through these different data analytics companies that have been created just to work in the esports and gaming world, to create this information and to be able to have it for those that need it. In addition to legal and the management side, there's been a whole world of business professionals from accountants to wealth management firms to financial advisors and other professionals working on the business side of the industry 
as we know, some players and team owners and other esports business owners are earning substantial money. You can only look at the Forbes list to see multiple individuals earning 10, 15, 20 million dollars. So, as a lot of these individuals are younger, they're earning a substantial amount of money. And similar to the other talent driven world, such as music and sports, where individuals, especially younger individuals, come into a substantial amount of money really early on. There's a lot of individuals that service that. Wealth management individuals, financial advisors, accountants, CPAs, and other business managers who solely focusing on helping these high net worth people that have a lot longer to plan for that essentially maybe he's making $10 million, but the $10 million needs to last 50 years. And these long-term ramifications of not doing things properly on the tax end or kind of on, you know, the long-term wealth management end could have severe repercussions. So as a result, there has been accountants and financial advisors and other wealth management firms that are starting to work specifically in the esports and gaming world. So this includes some of the large financial companies that we think of, the Morgan Stanleys and Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch's of the world, as well as independent financial advisors and wealth management firms that are existing to just work with these individuals, providing specific knowledge and know how to work with them and how to advise them properly. So I think it's really interesting to see that these traditional areas of finance and accountants that we think of as more traditional are now starting to come over and work in this space. And it's kind of all goes back to the reason why a lot of the other more traditional professionals are involved is that the ecosystem, the business, the amount of money that's being made makes it make sense. So in addition to actually advising and working in wealth management on behalf of talent and different professionals, there are all there are companies that are actually acting as investment vehicles and reviewing different assets and purchasing these in the gaming space. So you may have different hedge funds or venture capital firms or other financial vehicles that are actually investing in esports and gaming businesses. So you have individuals that are working at these companies that are assessing and looking through the data, looking through the different financial statements and the different corporate records the same way somebody would for any purchase at any other company. So it's really interesting, again, to see how this traditional business world is starting to come in, where you have the attorneys and you have the talent managers and you have now accountants and financial advisors and wealth management individuals who are working in this area and trying to have a specific knowledge and client base to be able to speak correctly to these people and to be able to help advise them and to understand their needs that, you know, you can be a huge gamer one day and the next day you get dropped by your team and that could be it. And, you know, or something where you're in a, you were big in a game and the game no longer exists or, you know, the team just drops everyone because they're cutting bait. It might be tough or you might not get signed anywhere near what you used to be paid. And your whole entire world, all of the financial obligations, everything you thought were going to be, are now not what they thought. And being able to have someone in your corner that understands the possibility that this could happen, how to protect yourself in case it happens, is really valuable. And just similarly, especially on the CPA and accounting side... I've had experiences of individuals that have went to more traditional accountants that don't have experience in the space versus someone who's working in and understanding the potential deductibles, understanding if you're a streamer or content creator, what things that are a little bit more creative that you might be able to you know, claim as taxable deductions based on it being a necessary business expense. And being able to think outside the box because you understand the income, the sources of revenue, the way the ecosystem works is very valuable as opposed to someone that just sees your W-2s and 1099s and says, okay, you made X amount, what did you spend on this, and have a nice day. So I think that there's a reason that more professionals are starting to come into this world because there's definitely a value in it. And then kind of shifting to the other side of the coin, we have the whole 
birth of medical and health and wellness professionals starting to come into esports. So we have the lawyers, we have the agents, we have the accountants, and now we have the doctors. So due to the high intensity and strain of competitive gaming, both physically and mentally, as I'm sure a lot of individuals can attest, and you can see in the news about individuals retiring very early and the burnout from you know, sitting in a chair for hours on end and just potentially not taking care of yourself the way that you should has really dampered a lot of professional gamers' career. So in response to this, there's been a slow world of medical and wellness practitioners starting to work in esports and professional gaming. So this includes both team and talent hiring traditional medical health and wellness professionals such as doctors and chiropractors and physical therapists and essentially other licensed physicians working in this space to provide medical benefits and to help the players, whether to heal from an injury or more preventative medicine, where they're just giving them different strength regimens and different stretches and even nutritional advice on how to sustain better endurance, how to handle going you know, overnight when you have different time zones, how to get yourself ready mentally and physically so there's been a whole world of esports psychologists and mental and performance coaches individuals that are just specifically working with gaming town and esports teams and people that are in this space so it's really interesting to see how there's a rise of esports doctors and even esports specific surgeons who are working to treat unique injuries in the gaming space diagnosis and really a whole world of esports doctors and similar to this is insurance professionals so the existing profession of insurance salesmen has always been around and there's a whole world of them working in the traditional sports world insuring players knees and elbows and other extremities from potential injury so similar to that some of these individuals have started to work with esports players and insuring their wrists and eyes and neck and shoulders and really anything else that might be subject to damage as a result of competing in esports or something that might cause you to have to retire early so you won't fulfill your contract. So there's all these insurance companies that are now providing jobs and providing insurance to whether it's teams or the player themselves in case of this. And then similar to most events, you actually have insurance companies working as, you know, providing actual event liability insurance and force majeure insurance and any other event physical you know anything else that's needed in order to throw an event they're providing insurance for this is similar to whether it's a live concert or a sporting event or any other live event where you have people and you have to get an insurance policy for So yeah, as we can see, we're starting to see a lot of the more traditional roles and professions that we think of starting to come in, where you have attorneys and agents and managers and marketing firms and digital agencies and insurance salesmen and doctors and lawyers and all of these traditional professions coming in and being involved. And it's really starting to just expand the whole ecosystem where now there's subject matter experts that can provide you specific tailored advice. So if you're working in another area, you can find someone who really understands the needs that you specifically have. If you, you know, an esports event organizer, you might have someone that works in throwing live events, event production, concert production, live festivals. However, someone that specifically understands the needs and legal matters or the marketing ways the different channels the different talent that makes sense and what game you're trying to work and how you would approach those people because i'm sure everyone will tell you that different esports games have different audiences certain games are much larger in different regions with different demographics so you have to understand that and it's not just something that you just know it comes from being involved in it and working in it and i think that that's something that you learn from a lot of these more traditional traditional entertainment fields and i'm sure a lot of you know colleagues would echo the same sentiment that you learn most of it by being in it and working in it and applying to it that it's just not something that you just really can just learn as you see there's starting to be a, a literature developed of it 
although it's still way behind a lot of the other areas. So this is a lot of stuff that's really changing on the fly, which is really cool. You know, recently the first handbook for esports medicine just came out where three um, prominent esports physicians who are working with pro gamers and official on staff for different teams came out with a book so that real traditional practitioners and physicians that maybe aren't familiar with it now can understand how to treat certain things, how to diagnose certain things. That's something they might think is one thing, might not necessarily be it because, you know, a gamer is using something differently. So it's just really exciting, and it really gives people the opportunity to maybe do something that is not the traditional trajectory. Like, yeah, it would be great to be a YouTube streamer, but maybe that's not you. But you can be an agent for them and help them grow, or you can, you know, be a lawyer or be an accountant or be a doctor or, you know, whatever you like and still apply it. You can be a nutritionist or a chef or a cook, someone that just solely focuses on creating healthy meals that have certain combination that will help you in long gaming sessions and trying to find out what you like and how you can bring it back to the esports world. So in addition, many traditional fields are really expanding to esports. You have, you know, product and merchandise design, both physical and um, digital sales, where you have companies that are actually helping, whether you're talent or event organizers or teams or developers, manufacture and design merchandise. So hats and hoodies and t-shirts and anything else that you could wear, as well as a whole world of digital collectibles from NFTs and crypto tokens and all these other digital collectibles that have really started to take esports by storm. These are companies that are essentially acting as an intermediary and working on behalf of these companies. Most teams, most players aren't having a manufacturing to make their own t-shirts. They're outsourcing these to the other companies. So it's starting to see how more traditional professions that are maybe servicing music, sports, or just any business in general can now service the esports and gaming world, can start having new clients that they might not have had before. And then there's a whole world of creatives that work with this. So you have photographers and videographers and writers and journalists and graphic designers and animators and web designers and audio sound and video editors and engineers. All these creative people that are contributing to these different businesses. You might not necessarily be a game developer and be an animator or graphic designer there, but a team or a player can hire, hire you to make a website or a logo or to take photos or to edit their videos or to do all of these different things where you as a creative person can take your talents, your interests, your graphic design knowledge and apply it here and have a profession. And there are actually creative marketing agencies that are existing that solely focus on this space to service this client. Additionally, you actually have professionals that are offering coaching services and scouting services and camps and youth camps and training camps and all of these different avenues for different high school players to get scouted for esports, different teams to get scouted. And then you have a whole rise of arena architectural design firms where you have these different companies that are working on creating state of the art esports stadiums and arenas, especially in light of many of the new requirements that some of these franchise leagues have where a lot of the teams have to have an in-arena stadium that requires them to have the proper technical um, and, you know, internet and sound and lighting and all these things to kind of give the user experience. We see some teams like the Philadelphia Fusion that are working on a state-of-the-art arena in Philadelphia, and it's just starting to be a world where Whatever profession or whatever job you might be looking for, there might be something tangent or something parallel in the esports and gaming world that you can latch on to or start working for, especially if that's something that you have a passion for. So I think that that's one, you know, as you know, there's a lot of stuff that kind of was kind of given, and I think that we all have to kind of take a step back to just see the brevity, the length of what's going on here, where you have individuals playing video games for millions of dollars to hundreds of thousands of people to millions of views across the world and as a result of this growing to this magnitude which 
for all intents and purposes, it's really just scratching the surface. In, you know, Korea and Asia and China, it's esports and competitive gaming has been huge. It goes back to the StarCraft and StarCraft 2 days. And it started to get bigger here, but it wasn't in North America and Europe. And that was only more recently. And now you're starting to see a whole emergence of Latin America and India and Kenya and the Middle East and Caribbean islands and all of these other markets that are starting to develop their own areas. And as a result, there's just even more opportunities to be a professional involved in it. Where if you have an international expertise or something just local, you can work. Where you can work in the collegiate level, the high school level, the youth level. There's a whole world of K through 12 middle schools and high schools having competitive esports, having these programs. And, you know, you have colleges having academic programs, varsity programs, clubs, anything you can think of. And it's only going to grow. So there's ways to be involved in most any profession. And I think that really just speaks to the volume of what's going on in it. Mm-hmm. Hey, Justin, we have some questions from the players focusing more on the legal side as well. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So the first question was about what are some of the things they should be worried about when they are offered professional contracts? What are some of the red flags they should be alert for? I mean, I think the biggest thing that I always think about and kind of what I say to my clients is I always think of the biggest red flag is a team that's not willing to negotiate. Someone that's take it or leave it, that's not giving you time to, you know, look it over, hire an attorney, hire, you know, some competent professional to advise you. And to me, that's a huge red flag. But then when you're actually looking at the agreement, some things that I think are really important to focus on, obviously the term of the agreement, how long it lasts, how much they're paying you, and what they're kind of charging you for. You know, I've seen companies that, you know, teams that maybe deduct you know, a certain part of your salary if you don't hit a certain amount of streaming hours or if you don't place in a certain level or you only make money if you finish in a certain place. So I think it's really important to understand what you're signing and to also kind of understand how you could potentially get out of it, what the buyout looks like, what's the termination proceedings. Like I once saw um, a players, like for this, you know, at least 10 different players that signed this agreement, that there was no way for the players to terminate the agreement, that the team could terminate whenever they wanted, but there was just nothing that talked about it. So to me, that's just crazy, you know, and I think that as a player, you need to understand what you're signing and that it's going to have long term ramifications. And then also understanding kind of the, the use of your name and likeness, how they can use your name during while you're on the team and how they can use it after. That's one of this, you know, a really big consideration for the player agreements as well as with sponsorship arrangements. Because if you're sponsored by Pepsi and your know, contract's over and you want to go to Coke, it's going to be really hard for Coke to pay you if Pepsi could still keep all the ads with your name on and all the bottles that have you. So being able to understand how your rights are used during the contract as well as after is really important let's keep on that vein with the whole idea of your likes your rights and um and you talked about the streaming hours uh we're very fortunate to have premier gg in our youtube they represent a number of folks as well what sort of arrangements should players expect regarding their streaming all these college players are used to streaming their own channels they're monetizing their own channels already what happens when they go pro what happens to all that I mean, usually, and you know, most team, you know, I would can't speak on every team, but most teams, especially the tier ones, the players usually are entitled to one hundred percent of their streaming revenue. The teams are not necessarily looking to make money off your streaming money, off your donations and subs and whatever you get from ads. However, sometimes if you're a big streamer and they're necessarily signing and paying you for that, they might. But there's a lot of ways for them to essentially input ads that they get paid on in your streams or in your YouTube reloads and replays. But most teams, especially the bigger ones, are going to let the player keep most of their streaming, if not all of their streaming revenue. I've rarely ran into a, you know, a, an agreement where the team gets 20% or some percentage of that stuff. I, I would fight against it. I don't really think that's standard. And I don't think it's necessary. I think it's pretty negligible, really, because... You know, I understand why they take a percentage of your tournament winnings and 
why they have the whole sponsorship deals and how you have to use their sponsors and that they may get a cut of a sponsorship that they bring you, etc. But I think the streaming platform, especially one that you've built on your own, they mostly let you keep. However, as being signed to a team, you're going to usually have to display their sponsors on your stream, on your social media, whether they're in chat bots or just on overlays. So, you know, that's definitely something that changes. But ultimately, I don't think, you know, in my experience, most teams take a percentage of what you earn from that. All right. Well, let's talk more about the IP creation side. But for non-league events, I, my understanding is that still Activision and the rest want to control most of what's created during the big league competitions. But if you're involved in a non-league event with your team, what rights do you have to stream that on your own channel? Do you have to negotiate that separately? I mean, you know, obviously, you know, the game developer and publisher owns the rights to the IP, which means they control all the uses, all the commercial uses of it. So, in theory, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook Gaming, all of these streaming platforms should and would get licenses from the developer to be able to stream these games and monetize them. This is obviously a very polarizing debate. The game develop everyone has their side that, you know, Twitch is a marketing vehicle for your game so people can see it. Like, I'm not gonna choose one side. I'm gonna go by the letter of the law that they have the right to police it. But as a practical matter, it's not necessarily in their best interest too. So it's one of those kind of where you could stream what you want to stream as long as you know it's allowed on Twitch. It's you know not obscene or kind of offensive or breaks any of their terms of service. And the developers are usually kind of okay with it. I think that it's important to be aware that certain ones, especially like Facebook Gaming, entered into license deals with Activision Blizzard to make sure that their ta their content was licensed. I know YouTube has similar licensing deal with Nintendo for any Nintendo content. So there are instances of developers and these outlets working together and licensing. But when a team has its own channel, does it ever try and keep, uh, does it ever limit the sort of content its players can do from team events? Are they usually looking for all that, as much promotion as possible, or do they often want to control what goes out? Well, yeah, no, they have they have the right to auto host and kind of program whatever's on your Twitch whenever you're not using it, and you know it's definitely a way for them to tap in. Where you know if you're not hosting, you might be hosting someone else from the team, or like you said, the official team that might be whatever they're competing in that day. So they definitely have the power and the right to kind of control and kind of use your Twitch, your YouTube accounts to promote their business. We had a question about team homes. Do teams still set up these team homes, and is that a requirement? They'll, will they sometimes make a requirement that they actually live in the team home? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there was definitely a big trend of these gaming houses of you know putting the players together for them to eat, sleep, and work together. And I think a lot of them started to get a little frat house vibey, but and that there was kind of some as we were kind of talking about this mental and physical kind of thing where. It was really hard to separate work from, you know, personal life. There was really no differentiator, and it was really blurred. So I think more recently, a lot of teams have kind of shifted away from that, where maybe they'll have apartments in market, but there'll be a training facility or somewhere else where the players go to actually practice. Where it's not like you go into your living room to practice, then you go into your bedroom to that. You go, to, you know, where you're just literally in one space the whole time. But I do think that there's value to these content houses, and there are definitely brands and companies and teams that are still doing it because you can do amazing content. You could sell the house and everything in it, which is valuable to the team. And sometimes you do get this camaraderie of all being there together, and especially in light of a lot of the events being online, a lot of the tournaments and leagues, your Wi-Fi, your Internet's probably a lot better if you're all together than if you're all spread out in different apartments. So I think kind of the feasibility of it started to make sense, but it's by no means the norm, and, you know, it's not a requirement for most teams, but some teams, they may do it, or they may just put you together in a house for a boot camp or for a month or two, not necessarily, 
you know, you moving in market for a year or two years or however long your contract is. All right, Premier GG, I'm expecting an invite to the Premier GG game housewarming party. Let you, you brought up insurance while we were talking, and it's I'm very pleased to see that more and more teams are providing insurance to their players. Um, is there anything that players should look out for specifically in regards to insurance? Are there reasons to get separate policies from the team policies? I mean, insurance is insurance, right? It's one of those things where, like, you don't need it until you need it. But when you don't have it, it's a problem where, like, I'm sure if you're a pro gamer and you're, like, starting to experience some back pain or neck pain, you know, or, like, you're starting to have some issues, like, it might not, especially if you signed a pretty big deal or, you know, your livelihood and you're making a lot of money on this, it might not be something bad to explore. Because at the young age, especially in early on, the policy might necessarily be a lot, but if it pays you out a substantial amount of money in case you have to retire early and you don't you can't stream as much as you used to because of x y or z you'll at least be able to kind of hedge your losses on that so you know i think it's definitely something to explore especially if you're earning you know a substantial amount of money and that could be a possibility all right you brought up agents as well earlier in the conversation how many are getting into this are what we seeing the standard agent deals where they're like taking 10 to 20 percent of what they're signing up for you and then some percent of everything else that you do are there they doing different uh deals since the uh esports competitors are already content creators and have that revenue stream i mean everyone is different but i would say that most of them you know especially in the larger ones have you know percentage of everything you earn it's kind of an exclusive deal and then you have others that are non-exclusive that are just taking percentages of what they earn for you so i think it's really kind of a combination of both and the percentages vary some of it's you know 10 to 20 percent that is pretty standard in the other entertainment worlds some of them are less because they have to be more competitive or in order to get certain players they might have to take less but because they're making the players making so much taking less is kind of negligible so it's definitely you know, a case by case basis, but you know, five to ten percent, ten to twenty percent. I would definitely say most of it falls in that range. I think if you see people taking upwards of thirty, forty, fifty percent, that to me is pretty, you know, aggressive. <laughs> we'll say that. So, I and then again, it depends what they're providing. You know, some agencies are providing you a lot more than just helping you secure deals and that kind of stuff so you know there's definitely a lot of corollaries to the traditional talent agents of music and tv and fashion and modeling all right i see a number of people sitting in our general chat if you are a ggda member and on our discord you can jump into the general chat justin's gonna head over there justin thank you very much for this any other i'm sorry any last things that uh, we we skipped over any last bits you want to talk about well, yeah, you know, thank you guys so much, and definitely make sure to check out my book, available Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere else, and follow me on Twitter, Justin J E S Q. that's Justin J E S Q. my DMs are open, I'm always happy to answer any questions, and, you know, talk to anyone that's really trying to learn a little bit more of what we've discussed, or find me on LinkedIn, so, you know, thanks again, and if you come to the chat, I'll be happy to speak with people.